Good morning, everyone. Great to see you this morning. Glad that you're with us here at Cross Point, as well as those who are watching live on Facebook or later in the day in uh, other ways. We're glad that you have gathered with us this morning to worship the Lord. The sun is shining. It's a little cold, but at least there's not, nothing falling from the sky. And so we're glad that you've been able to come and worship together. Let's stand together and begin our service with a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you this morning for your love and grace. We thank you, Lord, for your watch care over us, for your concern over us. Even before the world was created, you chose us in Christ Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for that love. And we gather here today to worship you and to lift you up. Lord, we pray for all of those who are struggling with many problems, with illnesses, with COVID and with uh, other diseases, with family members that are quarantined, with family members who we can't visit and people that are alone. We just pray that you would be with each of them, be with those especially who are in long-term care. We pray that you'd be with them, be with all of our health care workers and all the many hours that they give and putting their own lives at risk to help others. We pray that you'd bless them. Lord, we pray for our nation today. We pray for those who serve in our military. Lord, we pray that you would guide those who have been elected to high office. We pray that you would give them your wisdom and your direction. We pray, Lord, that as your people, that we would not reflect the fear of the world, but that we would have faith and that we would hold on to that faith, that we would persevere. And Lord, that we would be the people of God that you have us to be. We thank you for your word, and we believe that your word has a message for us today. And we pray, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts, and may you be glorified in everything. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's worship the Lord together.
God. Praise the Lord. Thank you. You may be seated. Those of you at home that were standing up worshiping with us, you may be seated as well. We're glad that you're watching with us. We've heard a lot from C.S. Lewis during these last few weeks, and again, he's probably the most prolific writer of the 20th century. And uh, I want to share some words with you again this morning from C.S. Lewis. He said, aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you will get neither. Aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you will get neither. I think one of the problems in the church of the last at least 50 years is that we've lost sight of heaven and we focus too much on earth and we're missing out on both. Any evaluation that you give of the church over the last 50 years would have to point to the fact that the church is weak, declining, and ineffective. Lives are not being changed. We are not uh, affecting society like we should. Now, there always are the exceptions, and there are many people's lives have been transformed in the last 50 years. But as far as the church itself, we have grown weak. And I think one of the reasons is because we have focused on the earth and lost out on both. J.R. Mitchell is a name that's familiar to some of you. He was district superintendent in this area, in this district, back in the 70s and perhaps in, in the 60s. I'm not sure when he was elected, but he was uh, the district superintendent when I first came to the Lehigh Valley as a college student back in the, in the early 70s. And his family came to church here while he was district superintendent. And his daughter, Vanjie, and her husband, Tom, were married in this church. Tom went on to become uh, general superintendent and then later CEO of World Hope International. And uh, th they're now retired. And this week, Vanjie uh, had some things on Facebook about her father. He was given an honorary doctor's degree at United Wesleyan College. Uh, and uh, some of the text of his speech was published in the um, Morning Call newspaper. Try to get that done today. But that's, a, that's another story for another time. But anyway, she had some lines from his uh, speech, his acceptance speech, and uh, they fit with the message this morning. I just want to share a few with them. He, she had a lot more, and I'm sure that she didn't share everything either. But here are some of his quotes. You will not fear life if you have faith in the greatness of God and its eternal dimension. Faith that only God is truly great puts people in their proper place. Once you have come face to face with God, we lose something of our fear. I would never agree that it is possible to be too serious about God and eternal things, but it is possible to be too serious about ourselves. If life is to have ultimate meaning, there must be an eternal dimension. I am a different man because I believe I will live forever. The one thing that really matters is where we stand in relationship to God and eternity. And that's the, the final of, of his quotes that I'm going to share this morning. From the very beginning of this series, uh, on the first Sunday of January, I made this statement, and I, I repeated it. I'm going to repeat it again today. But COVID has revealed that Christians are afraid to live, afraid to suffer, and afraid to die. COVID didn't cause it. COVID revealed it. It's been there underlying all along. But living in Christ, suffering for Christ, and dying are all things that Christians are called to do, but yet we are afraid to do them. And part of the reason that Christians today are so fearful is because because preachers of my generation, including me, have not given our people a clear vision of heaven often enough. The root of our fear is our lack of confidence in and clarity about heaven. When I was in college, there were a lot of sermons that were preached around that time. In my early childhood, up until I went to college, there were a lot of sermons preached on heaven and the second coming. 
There are a lot, there were a lot of songs in that time that were written about heaven. But in the intervening years, there hasn't been a whole lot of songs or sermons about heaven. And if there's one regret I have is that during the 12 and a half years I've been your pastor, I haven't preached enough about heaven. And in the 46 and a half years that I've been a pastor, I didn't preach about heaven. I'm going to be going on a medical leave starting tomorrow. And while I'm gone, I'm going to be working on sermon series for the coming year from July 1st all the way around to the next June. And I assure you, with God's guidance, unless he stops me, there will be some sermons on heaven. I don't know whether it will end up being one sermon series or a couple sermon series or maybe just scattered sermons between sermon series. I'll be praying about that and, and uh, thinking about that and trying to find God's direction. But we cannot live properly in this world without a proper perspective of heaven. And the reason that COVID has revealed our fear is because we're not as confident and clear about heaven as we should be. And if there's anyone to take the blame for that, it's preachers like me who have been preaching through these decades. In the lyrics of Crowder's hit song, Come As You Are, No Sorrow, he writes these words, Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Whatever happens to us in this life, whatever pain or sorrow or suffering or persecution, whatever happens to us in this world is not anything that's too great that heaven cannot heal. And so we're concluding our sermon series, Persevere, Hold On to Your Faith with a sermon this morning, Since We Fix Our Eyes on Jesus. And we're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 12. The first thing that we want to notice this morning is that we are told by the writer of Hebrews that we are to run with perseverance. Run with perseverance. In Hebrews 12, 1, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out before us. We are to run with perseverance. And he says that we have a great cloud of witnesses. Remember the great cloud of witnesses we have. If you look at chapter 11, you see this great hall of faith and, and you have those who, who lived by faith before the flood. Abel and Enoch are mentioned there. And, and then you have the Mount Rushmore of leaders in the Old Testament. You, you have uh, Noah and Abraham and Moses and Joshua and all of those that are interrelated with those stories uh, that, that we see there. And we looked at them. And then last week, we looked at the judges and the prophets and, and, and stories that we don't even have, but the, the writer of Hebrews alludes to them. We don't know the names that he was talking about. And, and he, he just sums it up by saying, the world was not worthy of them. They're celebrated in heaven, but the world was not worthy of them. This is the great cloud of witnesses, along with all of those who have died in the New Testament time and in the church age, the apostles, the early Christians, perhaps your grandfather or your grandmother or your spouse or your children or your siblings or people that you know and people that you love that are on the other side. They are part of this great cloud of witnesses. Since the imagery here is running a race, kind of think of it as, a, as grandstands full of a cheering crowd. And they're watching you run and they're encouraging you and they're cheering for you. I used to think that once you got to heaven, you couldn't know what was going on on earth because there's no sorrow over there. So if they saw us sorrowing, then that would bring sorrow to heaven. But the more I learn about heaven and, and think about heaven and read about heaven, I believe that they will be looking and they are looking at us from heaven's perspective. They know that the sorrow that we have is not worth being compared 
with the glory that they have. And so they're not saying, oh, no, look, he fell. Oh, that's going to leave a mark. No, he, they're up there cheering us on. Get back up. Run. You can make it. They're a great cloud of witnesses. In Hebrews 11, 13 to 16, it says, all these people, talking about those in Hebrews 11, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been willing or had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. These Old Testament characters didn't have the cross and an empty tomb. They didn't know about a risen Savior who ascended to heaven. They didn't have the Holy Spirit indwelling in their lives. They didn't have all the teachings. They didn't even have a Bible uh, to, to carry with them. Uh, these people had faith in God, and they were looking for a city, a heavenly one. How much more should we be looking for that heavenly city? And the writer of Hebrews goes on, and he says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. I'm not a, a runner. I never was a runner. I ran if I had to. If I hit the ball, I would run to first base. Sometimes I'd make it to second. If somebody else hit the ball, I might go all the way around to home. Very few home runs out of this guy. But anyway, I would run a little bit for sports. But the only long races I would run was once a year, uh, we would have to run track and run one mile. That's four laps. Half a lap was plenty for me. Uh, so I'm not a runner. But one thing I do know about track is that the uniforms don't have pockets. You don't carry extra stuff when you're running a race. You are trying to be as unhindered and unhampered as you can so you can run faster than the guy next to you. Back in this day when the Hebrew writer wrote, uh, the Greek athletes ran with just a loincloth that barely covered their nakedness. And this imagery is what is given to us. We are not to be over encumbered with the things of this world. We're not to be so attached to this world. Our focus is on running the race. Our focus is on winning the race and finishing the race. And he says, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. In Romans 8:18 8, says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Our sufferings, all that we suffer, all of our sicknesses, all of our sorrows, all of our heartaches and heartbreaks and mourning, all of those things, if you put it all together, is not worthy of the glory that will be revealed in us. And that's why we are to run with perseverance. I just told you that I'm not a runner. And if my wife were to say anything about running, she'd tell you she's not a runner either. Somehow it skipped a generation, but our youngest son is a runner. He's been fast his whole life. And uh, I remember very distinctly uh, when he was in kindergarten, he, he ran a race, and I think it might have been a 5K or something. I don't know, remember exactly the distance, but they started at the school. They ran. They were out over roads that were closed off, and, and they came back. I'm not sure all who he, he was running against, whether it was just kindergarten or whether it was K to 3 or K to 2, something. I, I don't remember all the details, but he was running a bunch, with a bunch of kids. And uh, during the race, one of his shoes came off, and he went back and he got the shoe, got down and retied it. Now, this is kindergarten, you know. They weren't probably real fast tying those shoes. He got back up and ran the race and finished second. Now, he, that's perseverance. He didn't let the shoe coming off keep him down or <coughs> slow him down. A lot of kindergartners would have sat down by the shoe and cried. Or they'd have picked up the shoe and tried to hobble it along 
with one shoe on and one shoe off. But he persevered. He wanted to win the race, and he would have without, if he wouldn't have lost the shoe. We are to persevere the race that is marked out before us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 to 9, the Apostle Paul writes, he's talking about all the things that he's been through, the persecutions and, and the difficulties and imprisonments, and he says, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. That may be a picture of your race, but we are told, persevere. Keep running, keep going, finish the race, hold on to your faith. faith. And then the Hebrew writer tells us that we are to focus on Jesus. Focus on Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, the Hebrew writer says, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Fix your eyes on Jesus. When the running gets tough, look to Jesus. When, you, when you're hurting, look to Jesus. When you're suffering, hurt to Jesus. When you're bleeding, Hurt to look to Jesus. Whatever is happening in your life, keep your focus on Jesus. That's how you win the race. It's the finish line. It's where you're going. Keep your eyes on Jesus. A story that comes to us from our missionary arm of the church, Global Partners, tells about Chris and Jennifer, who are real missionaries, but their names are changed for security reasons. Missionaries for more than 20 years with global partners, and they were faced with a major choice in 2020. After living for the long haul in a place closed to workers, their family made the decision to stay and care for their community during some critical weeks of the COVID-19 pandemic. As a missionary medical doctor, Chris was compelled by the love of Christ to offer healing for the sick joining the long tradition of Christian workers through history who have moved toward people at the heart of a crisis, even as the rest of the world moves away. For Chris and Jennifer, the persistent nudge of the Holy Spirit invited them to keep wrestling. How do we move forward with hope when the world says to go home? Be safe, keep your distance. Through all the questions, they heard whispers of peace, whispers we are all praying for now too. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18, in the same context where he wrote about that, that we're, you know, we're, we're uh, down, but we're not out. He says, therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that, out, that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Paul looks at what has happened in his life, and he calls them light and momentary troubles. Facing storms, facing riots, facing imprisonments, facing beatings, facing trials of many kinds. He faced them all, and in light of his perspective of eternity and keeping his focus on Jesus, he said, these are light and momentary problems. Keep your eyes on what is unseen, 
because it's eternal. And then that brings us back in Hebrews to come to the city of the living God. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 and 23, the Hebrew writer says, But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of righteous made perfect. This is, this is what we are to keep our focus on. The heavenly Jerusalem, the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. When the news gets you down, when the circumstances of your life get you down, look at your eternal hope. Look to where you're going. The judge of all is going to make everything right. We can be discouraged by injustice, but there's a day coming when the judge of all the earth will judge and he will make all things right. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 28 and 29, it says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. When we started this sermon series in Hebrews chapter 10, we noticed how important it was for us to gather together in worship. The Hebrew writer said, let us not forsake our uh, coming together as the manner of some are, but we are to do so, come together more as we see the day approaching. And now as we come to the conclusion of the series, once again he says, so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Yes, we're living in perilous times. We're living in wicked times. We're living in dangerous times. But we have a hope that is on this world. We have something eternal that's not seen. And that which is seen is going to pass away. And so we don't have to be concerned. Hold on to your hope. Hold on to Jesus. Persevere. Hold on to your faith. As I came to this point in my sermon preparation, I was thinking, how can I make up for 12 and a half years of preaching on heaven in the last third of a sermon? Or how can I make up for 46 and a half years in the last part of a sermon? And I knew I couldn't. And so what I've decided to do is to take parts of songs about heaven that have been written by others from Fanny Crosby, who was born in the 19th century, all the way up to our current writers, and read them to you. The Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians 1.21, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And too often we forget about that. We forget what we gain by dying. We shouldn't be afraid of living we shouldn't be afraid of suffering, and we shouldn't be afraid of dying because we are children of the King. To live is Christ and to die is gain. So I want to just encourage you this morning. I'm not trying to be a cheerleader and pump you up for something that you're, you're not comfortable with, but I just want to give you permission this morning to express yourself. As I read through these, this is good stuff. It's going to get good here in a moment. And it's not because I wrote it, maybe it might be because I didn't write it that it's going to get good. But if, if you're the kind of person who, when you're blessed, you cry, you'll need at least three or four tissues. If you feel like you ought to stand up and clap or shout hallelujah or amen, I want you to feel free to do it. However you express yourself, express yourself as you feel the Holy Spirit moving inside of you. Don't Hold back what God is doing in you because you and I need these words in these times. Heaven is real and it is our hope for the future. I can only 
imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine, yeah. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. I can only imagine. Blind Fanny Crosby wrote these words. When my life work is ended and I cross the swelling tide, when the bright and glorious morning, I shall see, a blind lady said it, I shall know my Redeemer when I reach the other side and his smile will be the first to welcome me. I shall know him. I shall know him. I shall know him. And redeemed by his side, I shall stand. I shall know him. I shall know him. I shall know him by the print of the nails in his hands. We shall behold him. Oh, yes, we shall behold him face to face in all of his glory. We shall behold him. Yes, we shall behold him face to face. While we walk this pilgrim pathway, clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sigh. Onward to the prize before us, soon his beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open and we shall tread the streets of gold. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Beulah land, I'm longing for you. And someday on thee I'll stand where my home shall be eternal. Beulah land. Sweet Beulah land, I'm kind of homesick for a country where I've never been before. No sad goodbyes will be there be spoken, for time won't matter anymore. Where my home shall be eternal, Beulah land, sweet Beulah land. Here among the shadows, in a lonely land, we're a band of pilgrims on the move, burdened down with sorrows, shunned on every hand, looking for a city built above. In this land of dangers, going here and there, trusting in the blessed Savior's love, though we may be strangers in this world of care, looking for a city built above. Looking for a city where we'll never die, there with sainted millions, never say goodbye. There we'll meet our Savior and our loved ones too. Come, O oh Holy Spirit, all our hopes renew. And then one day I'll cross that river. I'll fight life's final war with pain. And then as death gives way to victory, I'll see those lights of glory, and I'll know he reigns. Sometimes the day seems long, our trials hard to bear. We're tempted to complain, to murmur, and despair. But Christ will soon appear to catch his bride away, all tears forever over in God's eternal day. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, 
glorious day that will be. There'll be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness, no more pain, no more parting over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day, glorious day that will be. Brother, it won't be long. Soon all burdens will be gone. With all your strength, sister, run wild, run free. Hold up your head, keep pressing on. I want you to say those words with me three times. Hold up your head, keep pressing on. Can you say them with me? Hold up your head, keep pressing on. Hold up your head, keep pressing on. Hold up your head, keep pressing on. We are almost home, almost home, almost home, almost home, almost home, almost home. We are almost home. I'd like for you to stand with me. The worship team is going to lead us in that song. Let's sing it together.
there's one thing I want to say to all of us as I leave tomorrow. I'll be going for seven weeks. You might say, well, this is a long sermon for COVID. Well, yeah, well, I, I won't be preaching for seven weeks, so give me a break, okay? But, but if there's one thing I would say to you is keep holding up your head. Hold up your head. Keep pressing on. Hold up your head. Keep pressing on. There's a place that's prepared for us. Jesus himself prepared it. And in his time, he will come to receive him, to be with him forever. Yes, we have to be safe. We drive on the right side of the highway in the United States. We wear masks during COVID. We keep our distance. We use common sense, but we don't live in fear. Amen. We are children of the living God. And we will live as long as he chooses us to live, and we will live for him. And when he chooses, this journey is over, and the real life begins. So hold your head up. Keep pressing on. Persevere. Hold on to your faith. Shall we pray? Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the provisions that you have made for us in eternity. You never intended this to be our place forever. You've gone to prepare a place for us so that, you can be, that we can be with you. Help us to keep our eyes on Jesus. Help us to keep our eyes on heaven. Help us to keep our heads held high. Help us to be able to show the world that despite the distractions and the difficulties, the suffering, the dying, and all the things that are going on in this world, despite it all, the children of Jesus have faith. And we're going to persevere. And we're going to hold on to our faith. And we're not going to fear. Lord, there may be some in this room or some who are watching online who have never asked Jesus to be their Savior. They don't have confidence that they're going to heaven. I pray that you would help them to pray this prayer with me in their heart. Dear Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner. I was born in sin and I've committed acts of sin. But right now, in this moment, I repent. I turn around, I change my mind, and I turn to Jesus, and I ask him to forgive my sins and to be my Savior and to restore my relationship with God the Father. And right now, I choose to become a follower of Jesus Christ, and I choose to follow him with the help of the Holy Spirit and his church to live for you the remaining days I have in this world and then to spend all of eternity with you. Go with us now. And give us your peace. Give us your hope. Help us to hold our heads up high. Help us to remember we're almost home. We're almost home. Help us to live for you until you come. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.